Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. We thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth. Thank you that you bring forth more this night, this day. We thank you for all that you accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you for some time on messages regarding end time events. And we've talked about a lot of things. And we're presently talking about the things that are declared in the book of Ezekiel which are important because at this time in history, Ezekiel is a now book because of the things that are going to be happening. You must realize that this is certainly the days that we must do what needs to be done so that we are right with God and ready for the things that are going to be coming. We've seen thus far in Ezekiel the fact that Ezekiel, he, his name means God strengthens, he was in the midst of the captivity in Babylon's prophetic of the end time church being strengthened in the midst of captivity from the effects of the one world order that will come on the scene. We saw in chapter one, as we're just going to just go over some of the highlights of what we talked about thus far, we saw that God is coming out of the north, which is from heaven, through the angels that are coming to bring forth the judgment that is going to come. The judgment's coming to the church before it comes to the world. We see the fact that he comes to Ezekiel and he tells him that he's going to send him to the rebellious house, which is the house of Israel. And the truth is to be spoken to him, which is a type of him speaking truth to the church, because many in the church today are not in line with the Word of God. They're rebellious. They're contrary to the Word of God and not walking in line with the ways of the Lord, because judgment's coming to the church first before it comes to the world. And we see also in chapter 2 that it's a revelation that is given, and we've seen this before, but we'll show you again where the deed of purchase of the earth has been revealed to him as opened. Here, this is the deed of purchase written within and without. That's a deed of purchase. And what was written within with the lamentations, mourning and woe, showing what is going to happen as the seals are open on the deed of purchase by Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 5 and then chapter 6 when he begins to open up the seals. We see that then chapter 3, he said, I'm only sending you to the house of Israel, which would be again type of being sent to the church. And that there to, he's been to give forth all the words, everything, hold nothing back, regardless of whether they would receive it or not. You and I are to preach the gospel to people whether they want to hear it or not because they need to hear it. So then their blood will not be upon your hands. And we talked about how we are to warn them because if not, then if they would not walk in the way of the Lord, we would be responsible if we didn't bring forth the truth to them. We saw the fact that for those who will not listen, judgment will come evidenced by what we saw in chapter 4 where... For 390 days, he had him lay on one side and 40 days on the other side, which is the 430 days of, of judgment that were going to come on Israel because of their rebellion against God and not keeping the seventh year Sabbath of letting the land rest. And because of that, the judgment was upon them. And that's why they had the first 70 years of captivity, but then they wouldn't obey after that. And then the judgment was multiplied times seven after that for the remaining years. And that was another 2,520 years where they could not become a nation. And when that judgment was over on May 14th, 1948, they were allowed to become a nation again. That shows you that the judgment comes because of not walking in the ways of the Lord being disobedient. We also saw in chapter 5 where the judgment comes because of those who changed the Word of God. They changed the judgments. They changed the things of God and they made them what they wanted to be. We see that's a problem in the body of Christ because so many people have changed the Word or altered the Word or let scriptures out and made their own doctrines, doctrines of men, commandments of men, which are a great mistake. And this is the type of the problems that we see in the body of Christ with the doctrines of devils that have come into the body of Christ. They must be corrected or the judgments will come. We also saw that he is against all those who will not repent and do his word, but those who continue to sin and walk contrary to the word. And we see that in the Revelation 2 and 3 where he was against those who were not walking right, who'd left their first love or walking contrary to the word, who were in compromise, who were following false doctrines. That all these things have to be dealt with 
because the judgment is coming to the church and only the ones that are walking righteous will be able to come through victorious. We saw in chapter 5 also that they defiled the sanctuary. You cannot have any defilement in you or judgment will come. We saw in chapter 5, chapter 6, then their heart was departing after them and it pointed out that God was bringing judgments because of a cause. He doesn't do things without cause. He is a just God and He will always do things according to His spiritual law. Then we see chapter 7 come and it speaks about the end has come to the four corners of the earth, which is talking about the judgment coming to the earth. The end has come. He says that the evil's coming. It's awaked for you. Means at the time when it's going to come and that's about the time that we are at right now. And speaks of the covenant name of the Lord, the Lord who smites. He's smiting. And this is part of His covenant promises that He will carry out because he will bring blessing, but also for those who do not walk in his ways at the time when the judgment is set, that then the curses will come and they will be smitten with destruction. This is God's righteous judgment against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. We saw in chapter 8 the abominations in the sanctuary. And we saw about Tammuz, they are weeping for Tammuz, and that's all pointing towards today, the modern day Easter celebration, which is all about that, the 40 days of Lent for the 40 days of his life where he was killed by a wild boar, and then all involved in the worship of the, the Queen of Heaven who was Semiramis, that's all involved, and the eggs, all that involved in that false worship of what Easter's all about, which is a pagan holiday. And also they were involved in the sun worship, and that was, well, of course, what we see goes on with the Christmas and Jeremiah talks about the tree that's set up and it doesn't move. It's decked with the silver and gold, which is also an abomination. These are all abominations that were going on in the sanctuary that need to be eliminated from the body of Christ. We saw in chapter 9, though, those who were walking in the way of the Lord and were being, being praying, praying and witnessing and standing in the gap to see people come to repentance, that a mark was put upon them that they would be protected. At the same time, then that, once that was done, which would be showing forth symbolic of the judgment that's on the church, the righteous, they will be protected. But then all at the ones are not walking right, they will see judgment. Because he says, beginning to the sanctuary, they would slay all of them, the whole group. There would be judgments that would begin to come upon those. And this is going to happen in the tribulation period. We saw chapter 10 where, and mentioned the angels were ready to go forth and to bring forth judgments again. And then in chapter 11, the judgment's coming to the false prophets who are speaking false things. And anybody who's speaking false things is going to be judged. All the teachers, all the prophets, all those ones that are not speaking the truth, and they are going to have a judgment that's going to come upon them if they do not get right. We saw in chapter 12 that he continued to warn them and gave them the sign of removing everything from one place to another that they were going to be removed to captivity if they were going to continue to walk in ways contrary to the word. We saw in verse, verse 13, the ones who were the false prophets who were speaking out of their own hearts. These are the ones that were telling people they didn't need to turn from their wicked ways. They were teaching false things. These ones, of course, were going to be judged. And we also saw you and I are responsible to stand in the gap, make up the hedge for the church in the battle for the day of the Lord. And because he couldn't find anybody, he brought judgment. We must be those who are intercessors standing in the gap. We saw in chapter 14 the idols that were in their heart, and because of that, and they didn't repent of them, judgment would come. We also saw when we got to chapter down in chapter 18 that we saw as just this is in chapter 3, talked about those who would be hearers and doers of the word and walk in the ways of righteousness. And if they didn't walk in the way of righteousness, then of course they would be, they would die and they would they would be judged. And we saw the fact that, as we'll see today again. <clears throat> Chapter 3, he talked about walking in the way of the Lord. Chapter 18, he talked about walking in the way of the Lord, in the way of righteousness. And if they wouldn't, then they would die. And they thought he was being unfair. God's not unfair. He, if you're walking in the way of the Lord, walking in the way of righteousness, then you're going to be accounted as righteous. But if you're not walking in his ways, you're walking in the ways of evil, then you will be shown to be unrighteous and you will be judged. They thought that their past righteousness should count for them, which not so. And that's the problem we have today. Many people who get born again, they get a righteous spirit, and they think that, well, that's, that's all settled. That's the one saved, always saved teaching, the perfectly righteous teaching, which is a lie. Instead, 
God sees you by what you continually to follow after on an ongoing basis. At any point in time, that's how he knows you. And that's what he was pointing out to them. They thought their past righteousness should count. And they thought he was being unfair and they should measure out what they'd done in the past with him. Not so. God sees you by what you are walking after continually. Because remember, if they were walking in righteousness, then all their iniquities of the past would not be remembered at all. But if they were walking in, in righteousness at one point and then turned and walked in sin, then all of their righteousness that they had done in the past would not be remembered. Otherwise, God knows you by what you continually walk in. And we, that is so important. It's been actually addressed three times in Ezekiel. You see it again today in just a couple minutes. We also saw the time of the wicked leader, which is a type of the Antichrist, at the time of the end where he rises up but it declares the judgment's going to come upon him. This is in chapter 21 where he says, a ruin, a ruin, I'll make it, and I'll be no more until he comes whose right, the governing right is, and that is the Lord who's going to come and he's going to rule and reign and crush the enemy underfoot. We also saw that though evil continued to prevail, the land was not cleansed, People were not putting any difference between the holy and the profane. They were walking in all the ways that were contrary to the word. And because of that, judgment was going to come upon them. And then we saw also, we talked about the fact that in chapter 28 about Lucifer, because unrighteousness was found in him, he was cast out. And remember, we said he was cast out down to the earth. He was to be a spectacle. That all the, an evil, the an angels that followed him were cast down to hell, but not Lucifer. He was actually cast down to the earth where he was to be a spectacle before all the kings. And of course, that's how he was able to get to the garden. And then man, of course, made the mistake of, of disobeying God. The man knew what he was doing, but he was in the transgression. The woman was not. The woman was deceived, but the man was not. And of course, that gave the authority into the hands of Satan to rule and reign through the time of the least, which was 6,000 years. And we saw then that uh, also and that the continued destruction came. And we talked about how the judgment started to come on the different nations. And now we're at the point here in Ezekiel chapter 33. And we're going to cover a lot of things today up to chapter 40. And chapter 40 to 48, which is one of the most controversial and misunderstood passages of scriptures in the entire Bible and among all the Christians. We're going to bring the revelation of that today. Tonight it'll be. And so if you aren't here tonight, be sure to watch that because it's going to be important for you to understand the truth about what that is. This has nothing to do with a third temple during the, the tribulation period. It has nothing to do with a millennial temple being built in the millennial reign. It's all false teaching. And you'll hear about that all tonight. Ezekiel chapter 33. Here he said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring a sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for the watchman, if he sees the sword come a land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people. Whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, taketh not warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. You see, you and I are to warn the people of what's coming. And we are warning everybody of what is coming. The judgment of the church and then the judgment that's going to come upon the nations, as well as the one world order that is going to rise in these last days. Well, he goes on and says, he heard the sound of the trumpet, took not warning, his blood will be upon him. He's responsible. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Otherwise, if you are the one who now you give warning to people, then you're going to be delivered. And of course, the people that take hold of the warning, they're going to be delivered from any of the evil that comes. If the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, he doesn't give the warning. And the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he's taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. You and I are to be watchmen, and we are to give the truth and warn the people of what is coming. It's our responsibility. We can't shy away from it. That's why we're preaching the truth, what we're giving for. We're not just preaching things that people like to hear. We're preaching everything, including all of these things that have to come forth to warn Everyone, they must get right because only the righteous and the holy are going to come through victorious. 
He said, Son of man, I have set thee a watchman of the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. We must warn the wicked and the wicked or anybody who is not walking in the ways of righteousness, not just the ones who are not born again. We need to warn the ones who are in the church but are not walking in the way of the Lord. It's absolutely essential. And he says, of course, that you say to the wicked man, a wicked man, you surely die. If you don't speak to warn the wicked from his way, the wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. We must carry out what God says. But if you do warn the wicked, and he doesn't turn from his way, he dies in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul, as you see. Then we come to verse 11. He says, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked turn from his way and live and turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Meaning, if you walk in your evil ways, you're going to die. And the same thing is true for the church today. Because who's the church today? Who's the Israel of God? It's the church, as it says in Galatians 6, 16. Meaning that if we don't turn from our wicked ways, we will die as well. There's no excuse for any Christian walking in the way of sin. Because you're not a sinner any longer. You have a righteous spirit. Sin has no dominion over you. You have the Word of God. You now can walk in spirit as you get your mind renewed to the truth. You deny yourself and crucify the flesh daily, and you yield yourself to the spirit and, and destroy the soul realm directed life. You'll walk according to the Word, and you will not sin any longer. Amen. He says, Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of the people, The righteousness of the righteous will not deliver him in the day of his transgression. He may have been righteous at one point, but if he's walking in the way of transgression, he's done. He's not going to, his righteousness, remember, will not be remembered. He says, as for the wicked of the wicked, wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby on the day that he turns from his wickedness. And he starts walking right. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. Again, whatever you're walking by is by what God knows of you. And then we see another important point, another important point here. He says, when I say to the righteous, that he shall surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness. Ah, he thinks that he's just okay himself. And commit iniquity. All his righteousness shall not be remembered, recalled. No, you can't trust in your own righteousness. It's God's righteousness that comes to you through you doing the word of God. He is the one who produces the righteousness. For his iniquity that he's committed, he shall die for it. But when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die if you turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. It's all, you see, he knows you by your works. He knows you by what you're doing. Your doing shows who you really are. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed. Walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Even the robber, doesn't matter what your situation is, God will forgive your sins if you repent and you turn away from it and don't walk in evil any longer. None of his sins that he's committed shall be mentioned or remembered, this means, unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Well, they were mad about it. Just like people are mad about the fact that when you tell them once saved, always saved, is a lie. Because you can't just think because you were born again, and it doesn't matter how you walk now that everything's going to be fine. Oh, no. Yet the children of the people say, the way of the Lord is not equal or not measured out and fair. But as for them, their way is not equal. God is a just God. And He is going to judge everybody according to righteousness. And He knows you by what you're walking after consistently in your life. That is the key. What you're continually walking after at a point in time is who you really are. He knows you by your fruit. He knows you by what you're walking after. And we pointed this out before. But we'll just point this out. In light of all that's said here, you can now understand why it says in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 21 and following, what it does. Everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, not, excuse me, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, just because you said something doesn't mean that everything's set. But he that doeth the will of my Father, doing shows you're following the Lord and you're walking in His ways. And this is present tense, meaning ongoing, continuous action. Then it says many, and this is the sad situation, many is going to be the majority as opposed to the few. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name? In thy name have cast out devils. In my name have done wonderful works. This is people who are born again and we're doing the works of God, whether they're casting out demons or prophesying or doing works in his name. They were truly born again. But they weren't continuing in the way of the Lord. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Remember it says, I don't know you anymore if you're not walking in the way. It's exactly what this is referring to again. Depart from me. And why? Were they walking in righteousness anymore? No. You who are working, present tense, ongoingly, lawlessness. Iniquity is the word anomia, which means lawlessness. That's why Young's translates it accurately, are working lawlessness. <laughs> They're not right. You can't be walking wrong and think that you're going to be right with God. No way. Well, we go back to Ezekiel 33. What's the problem here? People have not put the Word of God first place in their life and been doing it. We come to verse 24. Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land. Where many the land has given us for inheritance. They thought they should inherit the land just because it was given unto them. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, You eat with the blood, you lift up your eyes toward your idols, shed blood, shall you, possess the, shall you possess the land? No way. They're walking in sin. You stand upon your sword, you work abomination, you defile every one his neighbor's wife, adultery, and shall you possess the land? No way. You're walking in sin. Say, thus to the, to, say thou thus to them, Thus saith the Lord God, As I live, surely they that are in the wastes shall fall by the sword, and him that's in the open field will I give to the beast to be devoured. These are all because they're walking in sin. And they that be in the forts and the caves shall die of the pestilence. These are all the different judgments that God brings forth. The judgments are going to happen. Now why? What's the bottom line for these guys? When they come unto you as the people cometh, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear my words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. See, your heart is shown by what you do, not just your intention. You can have good intentions. You can hear things and agree with something and believe it but it's shown by what you do. They heard the words, but they wouldn't do them. Your heart, if you really have a heart that's right before God, you will be doing what the word says, and that was the problem. Your heart's revealed in what you are doing. If you're not doing it, then that shows your heart's not right. Doesn't matter what you think. God sees you by what you are carrying out. We come to chapter 34, and he speaks of the prophecy against the shepherds. And there's a lot of them that are going to be in trouble today because they're not preaching the Word of God as they should. He said in verse 2, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? They weren't feeding the people the Word of God. They were only out for themselves. They weren't feeding them or doing the works of God or doing anything that they were supposed to do. Eat the fat, you clothe with the wool, you kill them, they're fed, but you feed not the flock. They weren't ministering to them. They weren't giving them the things they had need of, which is the Word of God, so that they can walk in the ways of the Lord and see the promises come to pass. The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, and with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. They weren't doing the things. Instead, what were they doing? Oh, they were being Jezebel, controller, manipulator, dominators, demanders, cruelty and force, telling you what to do, ordering you. <laughs> Anybody that's a pastor like that, you're done. You're going to get judged for sure if you don't repent. You don't treat people that way. Those are the Jezebel controller shepherds, and they're out there. What a mistake. They must do what is right in the sight of the Lord. So he's against them comes down to verse 10 and he says, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. He's against those ones. And this is what's going to happen to them eventually. I'll require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds, shepherds feed themselves any more. I'll deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be meat for them. See, some people, they're just, they're just using them for whatever they want. 
instead of doing what God wants them to do. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day that he's among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And they weren't being ministered to whatsoever. <clears throat> but then he comes down to verse 23, and he gives them good news <clears> of <throat> what he'll do. Because he's going to bring forth those ones who are going to teach the word. They're all going to be in one accord. They're going to be teaching what is right. And he says he's going to set up one shepherd over them. He shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Well, that's the Lord. Well, how is the Lord going to do it? He's going to do through those who are going to be in one accord with him. We're going to speak the word. We're going to hold nothing back. That's the responsibility of a pastor or a teacher or someone in ministry. They must speak the word exactly as it is. And then they would be in line with the one shepherd. I, the Lord, be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. See, the church is to come in one accord, speak the same thing, believe the same thing, hear, have the word in them, everybody walking in one accord in these last days. And he says, I'll make a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. They'll dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Those who are walking in the way of the Lord, and in the covenant, they're going to see the promises come to pass. They're going to get delivered. They're going to be protected. They're going to be safe in whatever situation. In fact, the blessings are going to come upon them when they're hearing the word and doing it. I will make them in the places round about my hill a blessing. I'll cause the shower to come down in his season. There'll be showers of blessings. God wants showers of blessings coming upon us. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit. Well, you and I are the trees of the field. We're trees of righteousness if we're walking in righteousness. The earth shall yield or increase. They shall be safe in their land and shall know that I am the Lord when I've broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. See, we've got to be delivered out of those that are not walking and not serving the Lord and not doing what needs to be done. All those guys that won't talk about casting out demons, they won't talk about sin, they won't talk about coming to repentance, they won't talk about things that are controversial and so forth, they're in trouble. They've got, you've got to bring the whole counsel of God. They shall be no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. See, when you hear the word of God, you're going to see the promises. You're going to come to the place of possessing them. You will be safe. You won't be in fear. You will see. You won't be a prey to the, he to the heathen or the enemies because you, know, you learn your authority, and you walk in victory. You cast out the demons. You overcome all the works of the enemy. Because you talk about the enemy and understand how he works so you can overcome him. You know your authority. I'll raise up for them a plan of renown. They shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen anymore. The shepherds are going to be judged. Only those who are going to be doing what's right are going to be seeing the people rise up, see the blessings, see them safe, see them protected, see them come to the place of being fruitful, delivered, and walking in victory in these last days. We see that there's judgments continuing on in all these different nations. And it's interesting, one of the, in Ezekiel 35, verse 13, it speaks of one of the things that they were doing that was going to bring judgment. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, they're laid desolate, they're given us to consume. And then he says, thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Don't ever speak words against God. He's never your problem. He's heard them, and you're going to be judged for them. We should never have anger, resentment, bitterness, or speaking against Him, complaining, griping, or anything. He's never your problem. He's always your answer. He's your victory. It's the devil who is bringing things, or else you are giving place to the things and causing your own problems. You can, you know, whatever you sow, you're going to reap, remember. So you could be causing your own problems that comes to pass. And we see over in Ezekiel then, he continues to talk about the evil things that are happening, but then he's got some good news for them again for what will happen if they'll get in line. He does mention in verse 17, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Can you walk in your own way and by your own doings and be right with God? No. The first thing is to deny yourself, and you're to live unto him, not unto yourself. 
Otherwise, you'll be defiled because you're walking after the flesh. And what does he say about the ones who are walking in their own way or by their own doings? Otherwise, you're calling the shots instead of putting the word first place. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. <laughs> They're considered unclean. We cannot have any uncleanness. That's if you are walking in your own way and doing your own thing instead of walking after the word of God. We come down to verse 24, though. He says, I will take you from among the heathen, gather you up all the, out of all the countries, will bring you into your land. This is talking about the Jews that he's going to bring back there, which he has done. And also, God's going to bring us, of course, out of being in the bondage of the world and bring us to the place of coming into the promised land of receiving Jesus and coming into relationship with him also. He says, I'll sprinkle the clean water upon you. And, you know, the water that, that came from the word of God, bathed them, caused, brought forth a new birth in them. And it says you'll be clean because we get a brand new spirit and we get born again. And he's going to cleanse them from all the filthiness, from all their idols. Will I cleanse you? He's going to begin to do a work to set them free from everything. And this also is showing what happens when you get born again. A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, prophetic of the new birth and the, that comes when you get born again. I'll put my spirit within you. That's the Holy Spirit that you receive after you're born again. Cause you to walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them. They begin to be a doer of the word of God. And as you do in the word of God, then he's telling them all the good things will happen if they'll get in line with the word and repent. So they weren't judged. He said, you'll dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You will be my people. I will be your God. You'll come into a relationship with him. I'll save you from all your uncleannesses, or deliver you, this means. And I will call for the corn. I'll increase it, lay no famine upon you. Instead, you're going to be prospered. God wants to prosper you and bless you. I'll multiply the fruit of the tree, the increase of the field. You'll receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Oh, you're going to be blessed. God's going to bless you, the work of your hands. Then you'll remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and you'll loathe yourselves. You'll have a repentant attitude, a true godly sorrow that you will hate all the things that you are involved in, anything you did that was wrong. You'll loathe yourself in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations, for all the evil things that they had been doing. And he goes on and says, Thus saith the Lord God in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities. I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the way shall be builded. Not only do you get cleansed, but then you begin to get built up. God wants to build you. You become strong. You become uh, filled up with the things of God and become mighty so that you're going to be able to stand against any attacks of the enemy. The desolate land will be tilled, wherein it lay desolate in the sight of all that pass by. He goes on and says, They shall say, The land that was desolate, it's become like a Garden of Eden. Where you were desolate in areas, everything could get turned around, and now it's going to be fruitful and blessed like a garden of Eden. The waste and desolation, ruined cities have become fenced. Well, that means now they're built up, fenced and fortified and are inhabited. So that's total restoration. This is what God is promising for all those that will turn to God. He's speaking it to them and he speaks the same things to every single one of us. He will bring total restoration. The heathen left around about you will know that I, the Lord, have built the ruined places and plant that which desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. So this was given to them. They should have repented on the spot and thought, yeah, I'm going to walk in the way of the Lord. But they continued to walk in the wrong ways, unfortunately. But there was a remnant that did return to the land, and they are the ones who are going to be there when the gospel is going to come to them prophetically in the end times in the last three and a half years of Daniel 70 weeks which is during the tribulation process and they will be born again and that they will all Israel be saved as the scripture says. We see this declaring the fact that they will come to this place in the valley of dry bones. He carried them in chapter 37 in the midst of the valley that was full of bones. Ah, this is a place where speaking of who this is Israel being dried up because they rejected the gospel. He caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and they were very dry. And no, no water, no life in them whatsoever. Son of man, can these bones live? Yeah, they've been dead for all these years. Remember how many years they weren't a nation, yet 
and even they became a nation, still they're dead because the place is all run by New World Order people over there. <laughs> the masonry symbols above the Knesset, I mean, and they have pride, gay pride thing. They, have all, they don't allow the gospel to be preached over there. Things aren't right, but they will be when the tribulation comes. They're going to get saved, finally. They're going to receive the gospel as it is declared. At the present time, though, it's still an ungodly place. Can these bones live? Said, O Lord God, thou knowest. Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Aha. Uh -huh. If they hear the word of God, it's going to do something to them. The word's going to come to them. He said, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And of course, as that was happening, he prophesied, and it says here, there was a noise, behold, a shaking, the bones came together, bone upon bone to his bone, and all these things came together, and then there was no breath in them yet. And he said, Prophesy in the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, breathe upon those slain, that they may live. See, they were all dead. They've been dead for all these years. But they're going to live. Life is going to come into them. He prophesied as he commanded them, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. They're not just going to get born again. They're going to take hold of the things of God and be raised up as a mighty army. Where these ones are going to preach the gospel. They're going to be a mighty army of the Lord. And then he identifies who they are. He said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We're cut off for our parts. But no, they are going to come forth. As he says, prophesy and say, O my people, I'll open their graves, cause you to come out of your graves and bring you to the land of Israel. They are going to come to the place of being born again and walking in the ways of the Lord. You'll know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of the graves. And he says that I'm going to put my spirit in you. You shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. You shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it, saith the Lord. They will get born again in the last days. And they're going to be joined together because remember at that time there was the Israel ten tribes and there were the Judah two tribes. But he speaks here after that about how they're all going to be joined together. He said, I'll make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. One king will be king to them all. There shall be no more two nations. Neither shall be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. They're all going to come together. And they're not going to have any more of these idols. They're not going to defile themselves with their idols, what they were continually doing, with their detestable things, their transgressions. I'm going to save them out of all their dwelling places where they've sinned, cleanse them, so that they'll be my people, and I will be their God. He's going to come in line, and of course, Jesus is going to be Lord over them, because David, my servant, shall be king over them, and Jesus the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. They shall all have one shepherd, they're going to follow the Word of God according to the New Testament. They shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they are going to dwell in the land that I've given unto them. Then we come to verse 26, and he talks about, again, these tremendous blessings that will come to them. I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It'll be an everlasting covenant with them. I'll place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. God's going to come and dwell in their midst. My tabernacle will be with them. I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. The heathen will know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary will be in the midst of them forevermore. This will happen when, during the time of the tribulation, the last three and a half years of the 70 weeks of dealings with the Israel, and this is going to happen simultaneously with the tribulation period. Now we come to chapter 38. As we see, you can see that these things are happening during the tribulation period. Israel's going to come to the place of receiving him. They're going to get born again. They're going to be walking in the ways of the Lord. The judgments are going to be rolled out. They're going to be rolled out continually over those three and a half years. And as we come down towards near the end of the tribulation time, the wars are going to increase. And there's going to be a tremendous, tremendous wars that will come leading up to the Battle of Armageddon. But it also speaks here of the time in the end when he says in chapter 38, verse 2. And this is happening during the tribulation. It's not going to happen before that. It's going to happen during the tribulation period. 
Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. The land of Magog is the area, as many people who have studied this out have pointed out, it's the area around the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea and the Sea of Azos in that particular area, which is really the area of where Ukraine is presently. This is the place where in the past where Khazaria was, and this is these guys were the most violent ones. Even the scripture talks about the ones who were preceded them, who were the Scythians, who were barbarians, and Colossians 3.11 talks about that. And there were the Sumerians. These were all ones that were very violent ones, and that spirit really operates over them. They still have that violent spirit operating in them. And this is the group that he's talking about. And not just them, but there'll be other nations that are all going to join together in this. He said, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I'll bring thee forth and all thine army, horsemen and ho horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. These will be the ones who are going to rise up in these last days, and these other nations are going to join them. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, all of them with the shield and the helmet, all these different ones are going to be joining together with them. Gomer, all the bands, House of Togarma, the North Quarters, all his bands with many people with thee. These are all nations that were just north of Israel. And so, be prepared, prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days you'll be visited. In the latter years, this particular thing means in the latter end of the years, more literally. The latter end, this is the word for end. And here are the years, the latter end of the years. Thou shalt come into a land that's brought back from the sword, gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, destructive place. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them, because they're going to get born again, see. Thou shalt descend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. They're going to attack the land of Israel to try to take it. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass at the same time that things shall come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. An evil thought's going to come into them of, of doing an evil thing, and they're going, to, they're going to go. He says, I'm going to go to the land of unwalled villages. Unwalled refers to that which is not protected, unprotected places. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, to take a prey. To turn thine hand again upon the desolate places that are now, in, in, now inhabited, upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. See, they've been prospered. And all these wealth, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions, will say, Are you come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a spoil, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Well, these guys are going to come against them. And he says here, They shall come from the place out of the north parts. Thou and many people with thee, all of them riding horses, a great company, and a mighty army. This mighty army is going to come. Verse 16, Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land in the latter days. Again, this is again in the end. This was the word for end of the days, plural. And I will, so this is talking about in the very end of the days, which will be during that tribulation period at the end of that. I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in the O Gog before their eyes. He said, he goes on and, and says, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? It shall come to pass the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. When they begin to attack to try to take the land, God is going to rise up with his judgment that is going to be poured out. We know this is at the end of all these, the tribulation period because of the next thing. It says, In my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. There's a great shaking going on, tremendous shaking that'll be happening. We see that 
It speaks here of all this tremendous shaking. All the men upon the earth, they'll shake at my presence. The mountains will be thrown down. That's all in the end. The steep places will fall. Every wall shall fall to the ground. That's when there's great earthquake, and that's at the end. That's when this is going to happen, the end of the tribulation period. And the destruction was going to come upon these ones that are attacking them. I'll call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. I'll plead against him with pestilence, with blood. I'll rain upon him and upon his bands, upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Otherwise, while they're coming, he's going to be pouring this upon them, calling them. And why is, what's the purpose of all these judgments? Try to bring them to repentance. He's pleading against them. He's wanting them to come to repentance. God is always brings judgment with the purpose of repentance. He doesn't want anybody to be wiped out. But if they won't come to repentance, then judgment will come. He's going to be pleading for them to come to repentance. But they're not going to listen whatsoever. And I'll magnify myself and sanctify myself and be known in the eyes of many nations. They'll know that I am the Lord. And then we come to chapter 39. And he says, prophesy against Gog, I am against thee. He's against them. And he's going to come against them. And here we see they're going to be smitten. I will turn thee back, leave but a sixth part of thee. Well, that means five, six of them are going to be wiped out. Will cause thee to come up from the north parts, will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. See, these are the nations are going to come against the land of Israel. And this is, remember, they're all getting saved and born again at this time. And they're rising up as a mighty army because they're now the ones that have come to be right with the Lord and walking in His ways. And so they're going to try to come against them to destroy, try to destroy them all. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that's with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. They're all going to be destroyed, the whole group, as they're coming. You'll fall upon the open field, for I've spoken it. The destruction is going to come. I'll send a fire on Magog, among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I'll not, will, let, will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. He is the Holy One. and He is going to bring the absolute destruction upon these ones. Behold, it is come, it is done, saith the Lord. This is the day that I have spoken of. They that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, shall set on fire, and burn the weapons, both the shields and bucklers, the bows and arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. When will that all occur? It will occur during the millennial reign, because this is at the end, and all this is going to happen for the seven years. This will be going on through the millennial reign, from the destruction that has come. So they will take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest. They'll burn the weapons with fire. They shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. They that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, set on fire, and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staves and spears. They burn them with, for seven years. This is going on during the millennial reign, as we see. So he's going to burn them with fire. And then we come down to verse 12. Seven months with all the people that get killed. Remember, it's five, six of them get wiped out. Seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing of them that they may cleanse the land. That's going to be going on for the period of time. Seven months because of the tremendous destruction. This doesn't seem to be the same as the Battle of Armageddon because the Battle of Armageddon will even be stronger, but this seems to be around that same time. There'll be wars, all kinds of wars. And remember, the destruction, people will be fighting against it so much, and they're destroying the earth, and it's just so, so that there hardly be anybody left. Remember what it talks about, that uh, the destruction will be so bad that God shortens the days, remember, by 10 days of the tribulation. Otherwise, there'd be no flesh would survive, as it talked about in, in Matthew. So... This again, this is one of the big wars that's going to come with the attack that they're going to bring against them. They're going to be destroyed. They're going to be eliminated. And uh, the destruction will have come forth. And then, of course, the Battle of Armageddon is going to come on a scene after that. 
Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them. It shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord. Destruction will occur. They will not prevail against them whatsoever. And here it talks about uh, the, the even, it's interesting, this is, they'll sever out men of continual employment. This will be part of their employment <laughs> to carry this out. Passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain on the face of the earth. These are the ones that remain at the end. To cleanse it after the end of seven months shall they search. The passenger land that passed through the land, when they see it the man's bone, they shall set a sign upon it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. They're going to see bones all over the place. They're going to be burned up. It's going to be quite a sight. Absolute devastation and destruction of all these evil ones that are going to come. And they're all going to be stirred up by the devil and try to, of course, come against Israel who's turned towards the Lord and gotten born again at that time, remember. And, uh, but God's going to rise up, of course, and defend them. So here they're going to come and they're going to be burying them continually. And so this is going to happen to cleanse the land. The land's going to have to be cleansed. And so here it even speaks of the fowl. And remember, that's the same thing that happens with Armageddon. The fowl are going to be having a big feast, coming to the supper. Here he says, Speak unto every feathered fowl, to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves, come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. The tremendous destruction in this group. There's also going to be destruction in other areas. One of the cities that's going to be destroyed also will be Damascus. It says in Isaiah chapter 17, we'll look at that in just a minute, that it's going to be destroyed and no more. They'll eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth of rams and lambs and of goats and of bullocks and all them fatlings of Bashan. You'll eat the fat fill till you're full and drink blood till you're be drunken of my sacrifice that I've sacrificed for you. It's going to be so much devastation, so many people killed. Remember, five-sixths of this tremendous great army are going to be wiped out. They'll be filled at my table with the horses and chariots with the mighty men and all the men of war, all these ones that come against them. And he goes on and says, I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I've executed my hand that I've laid upon them. They're coming against the Lord. They're fighting against Him. They think they can prevail against Him. <laughs> Not going to happen. Absolute destruction is going to come. So the house of Israel know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward because, remember, they, they've rejected Him all along. But this time, when they get born again, and they're going to see God deliver them, and this time they're going to stay with the Lord. They are going to know that He is the Lord their God from that day and forward, as it says. The heathen shall know the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. Because they trespass against me, therefore hid on my face from them. That's why they were in the state they were in for all this time. Gave them the hand of their enemies, so fell they all by the sword. According to their uncleanness, according to their transgressions have I done unto them, and hid my face from them. Absolute devastation and destruction is going to happen. It's interesting what it says also over in the Psalms. Psalm chapter 2, why did the heathen rage? These are the nations. And the people imagine a vain thing, thinking that they're going to be able to conquer the enemy, to conquer the Lord. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. See, they're going to be so run by the devils, they're going to think they're going to fight against the Lord and anything that's of him. And remember, the Antichrist is on the scene, running the show, ruling and reigning, speaking everything against God, and all the people that took the mark are already going to be in that state of under His control, and they're going to be all in darkness, of course. They're all through. They're going to be destined for the lake of fire. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us, they say. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. They think they're going to speak and they're going to stop God. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon the holy hill of Zion, because when Jesus does, after the destruction, he is going to be set. He is going to be the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and he is going to bring forth his rule and his reign. We see over in Psalms 46, 
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In the midst of all these things that are happening, you gotta be trusting in the Lord. He is your refuge, he is your strength, he is your help in time of trouble, as it says. Therefore, will we not fear? You cannot be afraid of anything that's coming. Though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea. That means the earthquakes are happening, the devastation is happening, the total upheaval of everything is happening, totally, completely. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Remember, the, the seas are going to be raging, the waters are going to be roaring, troubled, the mountains shaking, that's the earthquakes and all the different things, the volcanoes. But there's a river, because remember, the church, the glory of God is coming on this end time church that's come to the place of being perfected. The streams were made glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. And that's what the church is going to come to. God's in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. He'll be at the very, this means the break of day. And when is that? That's going to be, you know, the time when all this destruction begins to happen from the very beginning of when the judgments are being poured out in the seventh day period, which would be the third day, from the second two days after the church age, that next period, which is the beginning of the tribulation period. The judgment's going to be poured out. The heathens raged. Oh, they're going to be upset, but they're going to be fighting every which way. All the demons that are cast down are going to be fighting against everybody. They're going to be trying to kill off anybody they can using all these evil people. At the same time, God's judgments of the wars and the famine and the, the beasts and the pestilence, the plagues, are going to be coming on the entire world at the same time. They're going to be devastated by all the destruction. They're going to be mad. And they're, going to be, they're going to be raging at all the things that are happening. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. And he goes on and says, The Lord's with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he's made in the earth. And there will be absolute desolation that is going to come. These things are going to happen. And then after, after he does come and sets up his rule and reign, he makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cut up the spear in asunder. He burns the chariot in fire. It will all be stopped and ended. We even see the picture of these things that are going to happen in the end, the tribulation, over in Zechariah 14, where it says, The day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. This is going to be the Armageddon battle. And the city shall be taken, the house rifled, the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth to captivity, because there will be an effect of destruction in the city. The rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city, the rest of them. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, before Jerusalem on the east. Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east. And toward the west there will be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. It's going to be a splitting. It's going to be, the place is going to be split. He'll, they'll flee, so you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, anybody that's there. For the valley of the mountains shall reach into this Azel. Yea, you shall flee, like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, the king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. This is talking about coming back from heaven. All the saints. This is going to be at the very end for the battle of Armageddon. It shall come to pass here that this one day it's going to come. This is the day of the Lord, a mighty day. In that day, also, it speaks of what's going to happen through the church and during that time of the day of the Lord. The living waters will go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and winter it shall be. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. He's going to be the king, ruling and reigning. At the same time, we come down to verse 11, the men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction. No more. Jerusalem will be safely inhabited. But this will be the plague where the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. They're going to be smitten with a plague. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes will consume away in their holes. Their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. It's going to be unbelievable devastation upon them. It shall come to the pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. 
They shall lay hold every one of them the hand of his neighbor and his hand rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Judah will fight it. They also shall fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together in great abundance. All these things are going to happen. So it should be the plague. All these beasts shall be coming against us as this plague. Everybody's going to get hit with this plague. Uh, and it says, it come to pass, everyone that's left of all the nations that come against Jerusalem shall go even up from year to year to worship the King and the Lord of hosts and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They have to come and worship the Lord during this time when He is ruling and reigning. But there's still going to be curses that come on those that are disobedient. It shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth into Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. There will be hell. God's judgment will still be coming during this time because He's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to be, you're going to do what's in line with the Word or you're going to be seeing curses come. If these ones won't come up to worship the King, no rain for them. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, the ones that have had no rain, Otherwise, they've had a judgment already on them. There'll be the plague. The plague will come upon them. This is pestilence of some sort or plague. Whereas the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is all righteous judgment. God is going to rule with a rod of iron. There's not going to be any more war. People that disobey are going to be judged. They aren't going to get away with it. And these will be the people that have come through because not everybody is killed at this time. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's not like it's going to be a utopia and there's no punishment or no, nobody that could be disobedient. Oh, they can be disobedient. They will be. The punishments will come upon them. The destruction will occur. In that day there will be bell, upon the bells of the horses holiness under the Lord. Holiness will be the way it's going to be. Everybody, holiness will be the standard. God is a righteous God. Everything will be done according to righteousness. We come over to Revelation. Here we see the devils are going to gather all these ones. Revelation 16, 14. The spirits of devils working miracles go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day. The devils are going to stir them up to come to these things. So you've got to understand the devils are running all these people that are running all these governments now, doing all their evil things. They have demons that are giving them thoughts and desires and attitudes and they're all the evil stuff that they're doing. It's astounding. Behold, he says, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that's watching and keeps his garments. This is when he comes to catch up the church who have been walking in the ways of the Lord. Lest you walk naked and they see your shame, you've got to be watch, watching and keeping your garments. They'll be gathered together in a place called the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And here is when the pouring out of these judgments are going to happen. The voices, thunders, lightnings, a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. Tremendous earthquake. In fact, what does it say is going to happen? The great city divided into three parts. Cities of the nations fell. All the, nation, all the cities of the nations are going to fall. What you see, they aren't going to be here forever. They're all going to fall. Great Babylon came in her members before him to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Every island fled away. No more islands. They'll be gone. The mountains were not found. Be total leveling. The topography will be absolutely changed in the earth. This is the greatest earthquake that's going to shake everything that can be shaken. And we're going to see tremendous things that are going to happen. The upheaval is going to be unprecedented. Fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone that weigh of a ta weight of a talent, that's like 200 pounds. 200 pound hailstones hit coming and hitting people. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. They're going to be, instead of repenting, they're going to be coming against him continually. And then he begins to bring the judgment of the great whore. Then we come down to chapter 19. And here's where we see the final judgment is going to be occurring. Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. 
and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. Everything that God does is in righteousness. He's a righteous judge. He's going to make war. He does things because of a cause, remember. And everything that a person sows, he's going to reap. That's the law that works. You don't get away with anything. In righteousness, he does judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but himself. He's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. That is Jesus. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen. Who's that? That's the ones who are at the marriage up in heaven. And they're the ones who are now white and clean. That's going to be all the believers who are right, which should be every single one of us. We need to be right, of course, with him. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword. With it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. See, that's why there's going to be judgments during the millennial reign. He's going to rule them with a rod of iron. You, you, you aren't going to be able to be disobedient and think you get away with things. It's not going to happen. These guys are going to get the plague upon them, the punishments, remember. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. See, when God set everything up and everybody was supposed to obey his commands, that's the way it was supposed to be, and everything would have been fine. But man messed up in the very beginning, wouldn't obey his commands. He was told he could eat of every tree except for one tree. <laughs> and he still went ahead and did it. And then we have the problem we've had for nearly 6,000 years. He tread the wine of his fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. See, God is a loving God. God is a righteous God and a holy God. But he's also a God who is a God who will smite with his righteous wrath his wrath, wrath that it will come. He is a God who is not going to stand for evil. We already saw what he did with the flood. He wiped the whole group out, the flood, except for Noah. And now he's going to wipe out the rest of them at the end of the time, at the end of the lease, who have rejected him. They give every chance to repent. And including, if they're believers that do not walk in the ways of righteousness, they're going to be hit with the judgments because it's for all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, remember. He treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God. Just like we saw with the, the group there, Gog and Magog and all those different nations, you know, that came. They got, they were eaten and them. The, the flesh and their blood and finding their bones all over the place. You may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great, the whole group. I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him. The devil has stirred them all up, see. That sat on the horse because they're in league with him. They're, they're in darkness, you know. They're deceived. He sat on the horse and against his army. <laughs> no chance. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. They don't, no, there's no delay on them. They're cast direct, they're the first ones that go into the lake of fire. The remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Destruction to them all. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. This is what the, the devil is going to be finally dealt with. He laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He's going to be put in the bottomless pit, as it says. Cast him in the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him. He should deceive the nations no more, which is what he's been doing for all these years, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season where he's going to be able to have operation to, to deceive those nations that have come and populated the earth during the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. But remember, <laughs> those guys will be rebellious, they'll be. You know, the ones that won't come up, they're going to get the no rain or get plagues. But they'll rule with a rod of iron. But nonetheless, it's not going to be everybody's going to be doing right. I saw the thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. 
There'll be those that will happen too. And for the word of God, which did not worship the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. How could a person be protected? Well, if you're walk, walking in the way of the Lord, you know your authority, and you're operating in hol holiness, the Bible does say the promise is that no evil will befall you, no plague will come nigh you, the angels will have charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And there'll be a group that will come through who are the holy ones without spot, without blemish, that will be the holy group that will be presented unto the Lord, the glorious church. So who can come through the end of the glorious church? who are walking in the ways of the Lord to the rapture. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. They stay dead in hell for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection, which includes all those who have come from, uh, uh, the, have come from heaven. They're the ones, they forgot the first resurrection. Remember the ones who are caught up to meet the Lord in the air or those the dead in Christ rise first and those alive and remain are caught up to meet Him. The first resurrection includes all those who come through the tribulation period. This is why we know that it's at the end of the tribulation, at the time of trumpets, the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, which is the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. The first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no authority. It has no authority because you have met the conditions for the first resurrection. They'll be priests of God and of Christ, and they'll reign with Him a thousand years. Well, you're going to reign with Him a thousand years because you've learned to reign with Him already beforehand. That's the only way you're going to make it through. You're going to have to rule and reign. You're going to have to use your authority. You're going to have to walk in the ways of the Lord and conquer every attack that comes against you and not give place to anything. You rule and reign. You will be ruling and reigning with Him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed again out of the prison. He'll go out and deceive the nations in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. See, these guys aren't all going to be gone. Only five, six of them get eliminated. One six is still around. They must be some of the few that make it through. Together the battle, the number of whom is like the sand of the sea by this time. You see, you say, I'm going to come back here for a moment. There are some that are left. Isaiah 24 talks about this when it talks about how the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste and turns it upside down and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. And we come to the land will be utterly empty, utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The Lord mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away, the haughty people of the earth do languish. They're all good because of the destruction. The earth is defiled on the inhabitants thereof because they've transgressed the laws. They haven't followed God's ways. They changed the ordinances. They've broken the everlasting covenant. Well, that's going to talk about people that had, were in covenant relationship. They've broken it. See, it's not just going to be unbelievers. It'll be whoever is not righteous or not, or not walking right. Therefore, the curse that hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. But there's going to be few men left. They must be some of the Gog and Magog ones, and those are the guy, the evil ones, because only five, six of them, remember, get eliminated. But there's some more. They're still around, obviously, to gather them to battle. And by this time, there are numbers, the sand of the sea. They've multiplied, you know, from a thousand years of reproducing. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. Remember, who's the church? The saints. Because they've been per changed out and purged out. Uh, separation between who are the real ones and who aren't. In the judgment. The judgment on the church. The only ones that come through are the righteous ones who are the saints, the holy ones. That's why it's called the saints, not the church. Because the saints are the church. Because what does he present to himself? The glorious church, which is the holy one, the saintly one. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This time, the Father is going to take care of this situation. The devil deceived them, was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's all over for them. It's going to be finished for day and night forever and ever. 
And then the great white throne, him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fed blood away, and there was no place found for them. You see the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books are open. All the books are the books of all the works. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. There's one book that's the book of life, and there's all the other books, which are all the books of all the works of everybody. And the dead were judged out of those things that are written in the books, because they're judged by their works, according to the, it says according to their works. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. They were judged every man according to their works. Everybody's going to be judged. All these ones that are dead are going to be judged according to their works. And of course, they're going to be through. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And it'll be all over for them. They're going to be done. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Now, that doesn't just mean people that were born again at one time, because it's possible that your name could be blotted out of the book of life, remember. You have to understand that, because that was from Revelation chapter 3. That's why people think, well, I'm written in the book of life. I got born again. Uh, everything's fine. Not so. I have a few names in Sardis have not defiled their garments. They'll walk with me in white, and they are worthy. He that overcomes will be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. That means your name could be in it one minute, but gone the next. Just like the guys who were walking in righteousness and now they're working lawlessness, depart from me. Oh, their names are blotted out of the book of life. Or the guys who are defiled. That's why you and I must be walking the holy walk of the Lord all the days of our life. They're all going to be judged, as it says. But then what's going to happen? Then we're going to see the new heaven and the new earth is going to come. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there's no more sea. There won't be a sea in the new heaven and new earth. Enjoy the sea now because it won't be down the road. I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Heard her voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God's with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And we're, it's going to do, the only thing that's going to be there are those who are in righteousness. It dwell, righteousness is what's going to dwell in it. God will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. I mean, people have been through some rough things. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain. It'll be all gone. We'll be whole. The former things are passed away. You can eliminate all that. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I'll make all things new. Everything will be brand new, and it'll be a great day when we are in the new heavens and the new earth. All these things, faithful and true. This is what's coming ahead. And we see in Ezekiel that talks about it went through the period of where the continual judgments were rolled out, calling the people to repentance. We see we finally get to the tribulation period and all of Israel now has come to the place of uh, they got born again. The dry bones now come to life. And then we see the judgments coming at the very end of the attack coming against them. And we have one more set of scriptures to talk about and that's chapter 40 through verse 48. And it's going to be important for you to know because of all the false things that are taught. Many people have said, we'll just say this for a moment. Many people have said that this is talking about either a, because there's a, it talks about the measurements of a temple in here. And they talk about the, this, they think it's a physical temple, either during the tribulation period, but then they rule that out and they think, oh, it's a millennial temple. That's what most people think. It's not. You're going to find that out. Not so. It is not the truth. And I'll just give you one thing that we're going to talk about later on, but this will just begin to show you what this is all about. It's all about the fulfillment of what the Jubilee is all about, which is liberty and restoration and total freedom. Look what it says. It came to pass in the 30th year. 30th year of what? Doesn't say, does it? How did they count? They counted by jubilee years, every 50 years. Every 50 years, there was a restoration. You're going to find out tonight, this is talking about the 30th year of the jubilee, counting. And then it speaks of the fact that in the fifth day of the month, in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, and we're going to show you 
exactly how all this falls in line with all the Jubilees. And we come down, that was the fifth year, and now we come down to the 25th year of the captivity, so that's 20 years later. From the fifth year of captivity to the 25th year, that's 20 years, and what year did he say it was? It was the 30th year. 20 plus 30 is 50. It's all talking about the Jubilee, as you will find out. It's all talking about the fulfillment of the Jubilee, of the work of God in the glorious church that is going to happen, that is going to have the living waters that come out, and the inheritance is going to be possessed by all in this temple, which is God coming to dwell in us, the corporate temple. You're going to hear about all this tonight. And the end comes up where God now is dwelling with us as it says. Here it says, the Lord is there. That's the, com that's the compound name Jehovah Shammah, which means the Lord is there, the Lord is present. And where is he present? He's present in this temple. And this temple is not a physical temple. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands any longer. This is the temple of the glorious, mighty, end-time church with the fulfillment of the, the Jubilee, which is total liberty, and you're going to hear all about this tonight. This will just kind of whet your appetite for what's coming. Come or, or be sure to watch the message. It's very exciting, and it's going to answer the question of what the real temple is. It's not a millennial temple. It's not a physical temple, and we're going to prove that all to you tonight. Praise God. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation in Ezekiel of the judgment that is coming from the Lord as the end is here. It comes to the church to see if they'll repent. If they won't, the judgment will happen. But if they do walk in the way of the Lord, they will come through victorious and they will be safe and they will be protected. And we see Israel will come to hear the gospel in the very end and they will get born again. The dry bones will live, and they will be protected from the attack that comes against them, and they will be delivered and set free. Father, we thank you for the prophetic declaration in the book of Ezekiel of the end time events which are about to come into manifestation in the earth, and we thank you that we will see the glorious church rising where the Lord will manifest himself mightily and be present in that end time church that walks in the ways of the Lord. Thank you for your great work that you are accomplishing. We will be a part of this glorious, mighty, end time, perfected church where you will dwell in us and you will manifest yourself mightily through us Thank you, Father, for the revelation of the truth for these end times. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that we brought, all that's been brought forth and all these messages regarding Ezekiel so we can see plainly what it's all about, especially when we know the end is here. We know all these things are going to happen. We see the, what's going to happen coming down the line with the wars and the judgments and the things that are going to happen. And we see the judgments and only the righteous could come through victorious as we saw in Ezekiel 14. Thank you, Father, that we will walk in your ways and we will be the ones who will be the righteous ones. Thank you for everyone hearing this word is a hearing a doer of the word. They will get rid of every bit of uncleanness out of their life and walk in righteousness and holiness and be right with you and be a part of the end time glorious church. Thank you for all that you're going to accomplish because we are here as endures of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.